Good afternoon, everybody. Well, who better to have on the webcast than Jeremy Grantham, uh, the legendary GMO fund manager who was prescient uh, on this 15-month-long uh, uh, bear market uh, and uh, who can obviously help us all navigate our portfolios through these confusing uh, and turbulent times. Uh, wisdom and experience never go out of style, uh, no matter whether we're in a banking crisis or not. Uh, Jeremy, uh, I see that uh, just like me, you've been critical of these boom-bust cycles that the central banks have engineered uh, since the end of the Volcker era, uh, and that we entered uh, the bubble burst phase uh, last year. Uh, and I see that you're calling for an elongated uh, meat grinder uh, type of uh, investing background. So where are we going here in the short term, especially in the context of this banking related anxiety, uh, or let's call it a panic, uh, although the reverse of a panic today. Uh, and I think the questions in everybody's mind is, uh, you know, what you see uh, unfolding, what the end game is going to be, what it will take. Uh, before we finally see a bottom being turned in, say, as far as the uh, equity market is concerned. So thanks in advance for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours uh, and take as long as you want uh, to make the points. And then we can turn as usual to uh, the fireside chat. So over to you, Jeremy. Great. And thank you for having me again. Uh, first of all, let me explain that I have a a temporary bridge, a very unpleasant experience getting there. It feels like I'm talking with a potato in my mouth. So you, <laughs> now you know why I sound a bit weird. Um, so the update on the bubble, first of all, the most important principle to me is that the great bubbles are quite different from ordinary bull markets. And if you, if you average in the others, you, you get a lot of dilution and you missed the point. The great bubbles, most of them two and a half sigma or, or three sigma events are 1929, 1972 is kind of an honorary member on, on the cusp, 2000, the great tech bubble, a beautiful one. The most symmetrical of all is the housing bubble of uh, 06, three years up, three years down, perfect. And um, and this one, uh, let's call it 2021, and and of course, the mother and father of all bubbles, uh, Japan, 1989 in both the real estate land market and and the stock market. Now, when you look at the consequences of those great bubbles, life is pretty simple. They, they all get there after a long period of economic growth. Economic conditions that are perceived at the time as nearly perfect. Profit margins, nearly perfect. Investor confidence, more than perfect. Absolutely in full screaming blossom uh, where people are buying stocks because they're going up and, and uh, forgetting about fundamentals where leverage has has gone up a lot and where people have started to cheat and weasel more than normal because they can. Ponzi schemes have, have taken root here and there. Uh, Galbraith said that the size of the bezel had had grown and, and it always turns out that way. And from those points, from those dizzying points in 1929 and March of 2000 and uh, late 2020, early 2021, you, you could argue there's only one way uh, things can be resolved. Eventually, the easiest thing is to prick the bubble of, of perfection, uh, convince people that things are not going to be perfect forever, which they believe at the, at the top. And that way, you nearly always get a fairly rapid unraveling of the most speculative stock. Uniquely, you get this divergence uh, where the beginning of the bubble, the speculative leaders go down sometimes a lot, 
while the big blue chips continue up and people think, what are you talking about? This isn't a bear market. The S&P is up 20%. The S&P uh, it was up a lot more than 20% in 1929, but, but the low priced index, the speculative guys were down 35 to 40% the day before the crash in 1929. And you had nothing like that divergence. The low priced index had been up 85 in 1928. Nothing like that divergence where the high beta stocks are going down forget underperforming uh, until you get uh, to 1972. 1972, the S&P is up a bit, 17%. The average big board stock is down 17%. That symmetry means I can remember it forever. And you get nothing like it again until 2000, where as most of you can remember, what happens from March of 2000 is the the pet dot coms go practically broke in, in a few months and the growth stocks start to peel off from the junior growth stocks month by month, working their way up to the Cisco's. By the end of the year, after a decent rally at the end, the NASDAQ is down 40%. The balance of the non-growth market is, is not down at all. The S&P is down, but it's entirely the growth stocks. The balance of the market is probably up in the low double digits. And, and, uh, and then again, no such divergence until, drum roll, 2021. In 2021, I'm told there was a bull market. You couldn't tell any growth manager that there was a bull market in 2021. Kathy Woods' portfolio was in whole scale retreat uh, for the second half of the year, down big for the year. And uh, my own favorite, QuantumScape, my favorite only because I bought it seven years earlier as a startup. And it, it came at 10 in late 2020, like any SPAC. I hate SPACs, but it was, despite me, came as a SPAC. Went from 10 to 130, $52 billion for a research effort that wasn't going to have a product by its own admission for about four years or so. And uh, selling for more than General Motors or Samsung the battery comes in. I mean, that was in a way the apex of the meme stocks. I was too close to it to see it as a meme stock. And and it peaked in December 2020, the first one, because it was the most crazy. And then the meme stocks joined in uh, March, April, started to go down in 2021. The number of new issues peaked in December, January 2021. December 2020, and, and it rolled through the year. But the S&P was up 20, and the growth stocks were hammered. Uh, a, a classic and unique signal. And then we've gone through the paces, on average, looking perfectly normal for the great bubbles. So the first thing that happens is you prick the bubble of that supreme overconfidence. It leads the way down. And it continued down handsomely the first half of 2021, by which time most of the growth leaders were down 40 to 80 percent. And uh, my own quantum scape bottomed uh, late last year at 5.1 down from 130. That was uh, that's what you expect. And incidentally, to get ahead of myself, um, then of course they rallied. Uh, in, in the January bounce back of after tax loss selling, when you've gone down to 5.1, you've got a lot of tax loss selling to do. Then you have the money, you have your Christmas bonuses, and you look around for your bargains. And in those years, every 10 or 15 years, you get a, a, a you should expect a, a terrific January bounce. QuantumScape went up 120%. And Kathy Woods, probably went up 40, some of the meme stocks went up 50 to 100. It's what happens. It's what happened, by the way, in in 20, uh, in in 2001, following the great tech rout of 2000, it was a heck of a January rally, including on, on the second trading day, it went up 14%, and NASDAQ's still, it's the biggest one day rally. It finished up 12% for January, which it 
almost finished up this year too. And then in 2001, uh, despite being up 12% for January, it was down 20% for the year. <laughs> so in a nutshell, I, I was fearful of a rally as a bear. I was fearful of a rally in the specs, which, which we got. And that was part of the reason I said, after a timeout, back to the meat grinder, reason number one was a January rally, which is classic, typical, should have been expected. And reason number two was the uh, presidential cycle. Neither of these things are talked about by fee, fee charging enterprises. They're too simple minded and, and it doesn't feel like you should charge a fee for it. And therefore no one will talk about it. And, and that's probably why it works. The first account we had a GMO 45 years ago uh, used both the Janu a January effect and the presidential cycle. It had worked for 45 years then and it's worked for the 45 years since then. And the main reason is probably that it's so simple-minded, no one will touch it, including GMO, basically. <laughs> uh, however, I'm retired from managing portfolios for 15 years, so I'm allowed to wander into these uh, zones that other people won't talk about. The presidential cycle is just amazing. It's one of those few things that you can understand completely. You know exactly what's going on. What's going on is you want to stimulate the economy to have a beneficial effect running up to the election. And so we studied what moves the vote. And there's only one thing we could find, and, and it's probably because we were dopey, but we tried very hard. The only thing we could find was the state of the labor market in the six month run up to the election. Anything that happened before that was deemed irrelevant. You, you could have a brilliant labor market for two years and, and then if it was bad in the six month run up to the election, it would cost you votes. So how do you get to have the labor market be a little stronger or a lot stronger than average? Uh, and that is you, you, you have some moral hazard. You, you get the government and the Fed to say encouraging things and, and you uh, stimulate the economy uh, typically, uh, but you have to do it in advance because the economy is a slow moving beast and, and takes a year, year and a half, year and a quarter uh, to have an effect. So it turns out that that, that zone is October the 1st of, of the second year, which this time round was last year, until the end of April uh, this year. In that sweet spot, in that seven month window, since 1932, since FDR, that seven month has equaled the remaining 41 months of the presidential cycle. I am not kidding you, check it. Which means per month that that seven month window is seven times uh, average. I remember looking at David Rocker, who was a great short seller who blew up uh, in Lehman through no fault of his own. He, he was uh, custodied in Lehman UK and um, Went, went basically went out of business. But he had a wonderful record. And I once looked at the seven-month window. And in his 22 years of brilliant performance, he had only made money once <laughs> in that seven-month window <laughs> going short. It's like the short seller's graveyard. And so I, I, I treat it with respect and hence time out. So I, and I didn't know there was going to be, of course, a, a minor financial panic. And that may change the game. Every, every cycle is a bit different. But I was counting on the fact that it is generally tough starting last last October the 1st to get the market to go down through the end of April, which is in six weeks time. And then, of course, all bets are off. And, and uh, I believe back to the meat grinder, there is enormous inertia in, in these events. And what we've had is we, we pricked the extreme optimism uh, for six months, the first half of last year. Then we had a, a magnificent rally like we had in 1929. And we had some good rallies in 2000 and, and, and that's part of the course. So we had a good rally. And, uh, and then the difficult phase is always phase three, which is the fundamentals, waiting for 
basically earnings and fundamentals like unemployment and the GDP growth uh, to turn down. And they do it with leads and lags, which would make your hair fall out. It's always different, etc. But without getting in to too many details, which everyone does, we all get into too many details. The big picture is we have a little handful of these super bubbles. Every one of them is followed by a recession, right? That's pretty simple. If you get anything really wrong, like 1929, it's followed by depression. If you mess around with the financial system, you have the terrible happenings of the great financial crash. But if you do everything more or less right, if the housing market is just fine, actually cheap in 2000, the bond market is very cheap in 2000. You're really trying to make life simple. You still have a mild recession. And you still have the NASDAQ go down 82%. You still have the S&P go down 50, even though Greenspan is roaring in to help it, to cushion the pain, to make life friendly, lots of moral hazard, lowering the rates. And still it goes down 50. So the big picture is you always get a recession. You always get a terrible wipeout of the specs, and, and you get a pretty hefty decline in the S&P. And uh, if you do anything gratuitously worse than that, like uh, having a bubble in more than one asset class or messing up your economic policies or your financial policies, you will do worse and things will be bad, which we'll get to. Japan, of course, committed the heinous crime of having the greatest bubble in real estate simultaneously to the greatest bubble uh, ever, 65 times earnings in the stock market. Uh, but the 65 times earnings was not nearly as bad as the as the bubble they had in, in real estate, where the land under the Empress Palace actually really was worth more than the state of California. And more than 10 times the square foot rent downtown Tokyo uh, to New York, to Manhattan. Just incredible. The biggest bubble, I suspect, in history, including the South Sea bubble and, the, and tulips. Um, so where are we now? We're waiting for the inevitable effect of huge overconfidence uh, unraveling, of perfect economics becoming less perfect, which they are, of course, and record profit margins eventually uh, becoming less than record. And, and and then some sort of interaction of those variables. That's the base case. And sometimes if left to its own, it will take a long time. And what we have this time is the intrusion of the presidential cycle to create a timeout. That has never happened, by the way. If you go back and you look at the other bubbles, you will see that it neatly sidesteps uh, in 1929, uh, this little window where it has a nice rally. <laughs> And it neatly sidesteps in 72. Uh, the, the, this phase occurs in, in uh, 1975, where you have a huge bounce back. And uh, it, it sidesteps again in 2000, 2000, 2001, 2002, miss it. Um, this is the first of the great bubbles that has a presidential cycle effect, slap in the middle. And uh, so I, for one, was thinking, as I wrote, time out uh, for a few months and, and then back to business. And, and the economic unraveling can take a long time. And why? Just think about housing. Housing is one of the most dependable things that happen uh, as a result of interest rates. If you had a mortgage at 2.8 and then a new mortgage is five or five and a half or six or six and a half for a while, this is a dramatic shift. It changes the housing markets all over the world. Turns out that the housing market is more elevated, unlike the stock market. The stock market is mainly a US event like it was in 2000. Housing market is, yes, it's in the US. We actually were selling in December at a higher multiple of family income, which is the best long-term measure. We were selling slightly higher than the peak of the quote housing bubble 
of, of 2006. But we were still in December, way below Canada, Australia, the UK, China. They, they are having real humdingers. They are not going from three and a half times family income to seven times. They have gone to double digit multiples of family income in most of the districts of London and, and, and Toronto and Vancouver and Sydney and so on. And, and they are floating rates. So the cost flows immediately through and uh, has a crippling effect. But it doesn't, it doesn't work overnight. It has a slow effect on, on building new houses, which is not that big a component of GDP. But it, if you throw in furniture sales and improvements and so on, it's quite a bit. That goes down steadily. The housing declines typically go at half or a third of the speed of the stock market. Stock market is always kind of on speed in comparison. And you can't count the last housing bubble peaked in 2006 and troughed in, in, in uh, 2012. It took six years. And the stock market that time took a year and a half. But um, sometimes it takes up to three years of a bear market in stocks. But housing can be much slower. So it, it, it slows the economic effect way down. It filters through very slowly. Some of the initial impacts are counterintuitive. People don't want to sell because they can't afford to pay a new mortgage. So they don't, they're very reluctant, quite reasonably, to give up their three and a quarter mortgage and replace it at twice the cost. So the housing supply counterintuitively drops off and can create artificially reasonably high prices for a while. And that gradually flows through the system. However, people get normalized. They have to move eventually, and so they do. And uh, the prices weaken. But the economy moves very slowly. And, uh, and then you look around in general to see where the stress points are. And I have written fairly, and, and I was in a podcast two days before the crash, and I was making the same point that the stresses build up like a huge pressure behind a dam, and you can't really work out which brick is gonna go uh, in the dam. Um, first, you, you, you can be pretty confident that sooner or later, the great bubbles as they break will find a pressure point. And you can also be pretty confident that you will probably be surprised exactly where it occurs. And uh, I remember thinking about Bear Stearns. I thought, you know, Bear, Bear Stearns had the reputation for being the guys who, who created the uh, shitty bits of paper. And when the music stopped, uh, it was always someone else who had it. I could never work out why in this particular cycle they they did their usual job of creating shitty paper and somehow ended up with far too much of it themselves. Uh, th <laughs> this is not a good idea, and and one they had never indulged in before. But um, so we have just recently seen some unexpected pressure points, which you could say are unexpected, but I would say from sixty thousand feet, they're totally uh, predictable. It is predictable that something will fail and you will be surprised at what particular piece it is. I have been saying this for years and I feel totally vindicated that something has gone and something that went is unexpected. That is the nature of the beast. Who knew that Bear Stearns would go? Who knew, in a way, who knew that Lehman would be picked on? But uh, certainly this harmless looking bank uh, in, in Silicon Valley, uh, providing a very useful service. Of course, if you get closer to it, uh, as always happens after the event, you can see its vulnerability to uh, venture capital and so on. So what's next? The trouble with this bubble is, is the troubles are actually manifold. One of which is, as many people have said, it's an everything bubble. So we have bubbled the important and dangerous housing market, not, not as crazy, crazily as we did in, in the housing bubble, 
but uh, in sheer price, we boosted it up to records. We bubbled the, the bond market to levels that had never been seen in the history of man uh, with the lowest rates ever recorded, of course. Fine arts and every other asset through the roof and equities, particularly in the US, uh, at, uh, at or close to the highest points ever reached in the most dependable forms of uh, long-term evaluation um, where you smooth the earnings Schiller style, or one could say Hussman style. Uh, the most reliable ones are at or close uh, to the level of, uh, of 2000. So we've done all the bubbles together. Japan says not to do that if you can possibly help it. It's bad enough just doing the equity market in 2000. And this time we have done a dead ringer for the equity market. Plus, for gravy, uh, we've done the housing market and the bond market. Bonds were wonderfully cheap in 2000 and houses were cheap. So that's a no-no. The second no-no is that brings up a paper I'm trying hard to write, my usual writer's block, uh, and it's called The Long Term Is Now. And it's looking at all the long-term factors I've been worried about for 15 years and, and, and talking to an audience with glazed eyes <laughs> for most of the time. And they all suddenly seem to be biting us. And they are climate change, climate change, caused so much damage last year, I think it knocked half a point off the global GDP for the first time. Uh, and that was floods everywhere and, and fires uh, here, here and there, but, but, but record. And that was a lot of pain and food, food pressure. Um, climate change gets in the way of planting, reaping, and even the fertility, uh, the productivity of, of the grains and others. So it's an inflationary force uh, uh, to be to be dealt with, uh, to be to be understood, let's put it that way. And then the, the second one that we've been hacking away since our report of 2011, which was called Time to Wake Up, the, the era of plentiful cheap resources has gone forever. And uh, the only reason people read it was because it was the top of a great cycle. And that's the price you have to pay if you want readership. So then it, it, promptly, it promptly broke for a few years as China slowed and the weather improved in the grain growing areas. Uh, but, but then it regrouped again. For a hundred years, it had been trending down persistently. It had dropped over a percent a year. It was a 70% decline in the cost of the average resource. We have a very interesting index. And that is 35 equal weighted important commodities. We wanted to ask the question, what is happening to commodities? Not what is happening to oil, what is happening to corn, but what is happening to commodities in general? So you equal weight it and we plug it in and we see it decline for a hundred years uh, uh, from 1900 to 2002 with three spectacular rallies, World War I, World War II and uh, OPEC. Eh, why wouldn't that be the case? But in between, they, they jump back on the trend and, and carry on down. 2002, something ha happens. And, and a large chunk of it is China, who tries to grow, the first time in history, a giant economy increasing its demand in six, seven, eight percent a year. And then to rub it in the last four years of the cycle at double digit rates for demand for cement uh, and coal and iron ore. Uh, and, and nevertheless, under that data, uh, my colleague and I believed that there was a very high probability that the game had changed, that there had been a paradigm shift <clears throat> in resources. What had happened is that for 100 years, the technology had been growing at something like 3% a year, and the, and the diminishing return effect of drilling uh, deeper wells and, and mining lower quality ore were, was adding a couple of percent. So it was minus two plus three and technology was winning. And we thought there was some reason by 2011 to suggest the opposite. And that is, if anything, the diminishing returns 
was adding a minus three and the technology, if anything, had backed off and, and was more like plus one or two. And so suddenly the cost was rising. And our index went from 100 to uh, 33, not bad, in 2002. And today, it's, uh, or last December anyway, was a little over 90, 91. It had basically tripled. Um, this is a different world that we've been living in, on, on, in, in the case of resources. And it's been hidden by massively declining rates and a pretty decent global economy. But underneath, this is a, an eddy, a back, a back current to the main forward current of, of uh, easy money and so on. And it's inflationary. If you have to pay more as a cost of doing business, more for your energy, more for your iron ore, etc. And these uh, multiply out. Instead of mining 3% quality copper, you mine one and three quarters. You have to dig a deeper hole and the cost of the energy is also double what it used to be. Uh, so you triple or quadruple your cost uh, of your inputs. And, and if you input more for your necessary raw materials than you used to, that's coming straight off the top of your growth rate. And you mismeasure it because GDP is a, is a list of the costs. So if you spend more drilling for offshore Brazilian oil, your GDP goes up. You get the same oil that you got from a 50 cent barrel in the Saudi field that had been pumping away happily since 1942. But that's not how you account for it. You account for it with all those guys from Schlumberger taking helicopter flights out 150 miles offshore, drilling incredibly expensive deep, deep oil wells. So that that is just inflationary. It is just uh, hurting the growth rate of the rest of the of the economy. And the next factor is people. There is a bigger people bust going on. People beginning happily to talk about it last two years and the last few months has been a real burst of serious articles. But there is a population bust in the developed world plus China, the like of which you can't imagine. The, the babies born this year will be about the same globally, um, will be about the same as 2000, despite a, a massive increase in the babies born in Africa, uh, because there's been a steady decrease in babies born everywhere else. Uh, for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, the general population of babies has been increasing very slowly at first, very rapidly since the Industrial Revolution. And now, for the first time, it's going back. And it is absolutely guaranteed the next 20 years we will have uh, fewer young workers, 20-year-olds, presenting themselves to the marketplace because we know that. One of the rare things in economics that is certain because they're already born and the baby cohorts have been getting less for 20 years. Japan, of course, is 20 years ahead of us, and, and the cohort uh, presenting for a military service is, is down approaching 30%. Uh, and that is what is going to happen uh, to most of us. Fertility rates need to be 2.1. In South Korea, uh, leading the pack was 0.8 last year, which halves your population, more than halves your population every single generation of, of babies. Uh, quite remarkable. Japan is about 1.3. Uh, China was about 1.3 last year. Uh, China has a special problem. The two-child policy uh, created a wafer-thin segment between 20-year-olds and 40-year-olds, which is the guys who have babies. And uh, it also produced a 15% tilt to men. Um, so you have a chronic shortage of fertile women times a miserable fertility rate of 1.3. The rest of the world has to deal with the 1.3 or the 1.7 in the US and the UK, but they don't have to deal with the fact there aren't any fertile women. China has both. So China is going to have to deal with the speed of a shift in their population profile, the like of which no one has ever imagined, ever. In, in the space of 20, 30 years, they're going to run out of workers. They're going to have such stress supporting their old people before they're really rich 
that you have to worry if you're a Chinese uh, Mandarin, you have to worry about, are you going to keep a stable society going with these kind of stresses? So I, th I think the idea that China is going to conquer the world is, is, is a little pessimistic. I think they're going to have to take all their efforts to address this particular unique problem. But it affects everyone in the world. The other day, 20 years ago, we had China opening up the greatest pool of useful labor in history. And you throw in Eastern Europe, but you're talking 500 million extra eager workers combined are flooding into the cities, plugging into a pretty decent system or starting to work in the case of, case of East Germany, uh, of Eastern Europe. And, and suddenly you had combined with globalization, a great opportunity to outsource to the cheapest pool of labor anywhere and capitalize on your brand. And, uh, and that's what happened. And, uh, and now that is over. We're deglobalizing, which is inflationary and inefficient, of course, hence it's inflationary. And, and we're gonna deal with the declining global population of, of young workers, except in Africa where the baby cohorts will begin to, to drop, but the, the supply of workers is still growing rapidly for quite a long time. Um, and you can balance the books very nicely if the developed world in China wants to take a great supply of African immigrants. I am not holding my breath on this one. Um, so there are two paradoxical problems and very big problems to do with population. One is in the developed world plus China, we have a population bust that will threaten the virility, if you will, of the economy. And at the same time, we have a booming population in Africa that will threaten their, their ability to feed and maintain a stable society. They have the worst soil, the worst governance, the longest distances, and uh, and and climate change problems. Um, it it is not a pretty outlook for them. Anyway, that that's inflationary. So we we have almost every influence here beginning to impact as we sit. People beginning to talk about it, think about it, beginning to show up in the labor markets, not just in the U.S. but everywhere. We are beginning to run out of labor. Uh, we're beginning to run out of cheap resources. If you look at the resources needed to green the economy, we have chronically uh, a chronic insufficiency, which brings up a little plug. GMO has a climate change fund, excellent five-year record, and I recommend funds like that. There is an enormous wind uh, behind uh, climate change investing. The US government, the governments of the world, the regulations of the world uh, are all shifting behind climate change. Is there any chance that the top line revenue of the green economy will not outdistance by a lot uh, the top line revenue of the ungreen world? It's like comparing electric vehicles to gasoline vehicles and uh, green electricity uh, to coal electricity. Now, these are done deals and there will be enormous expenditures required uh, to replace the uh, dopey transmission lines with state-of-the-art, uh, high-voltage, uh, efficient lines, replacing the transportation fleets of everything. Uh, great opportunities in the long run to have a high return on investment, to save money, to generate cheaper and cheaper electricity. We will have plenty of cheap green power in the end. Uh, in 50 years. And by the way, it will make the cleanest cities in the history of cities. When you take out all the particulate matter, no more diesel uh, by law, everything is electric. It will be wonderfully healthy uh, to walk through the downtown Boston and Manhattan in a way it has never been before. But I digress. The point I'm trying to make here is that these long-term factors have decided climate change resources and people 
have decided to all bite at the same time. And they come in right into the short term factors that we all know and love, which is wartime kerfuffle, COVID kerfuffle, uh, creating little ripples of bottlenecks everywhere, uh, which will take a while to play through the system. They come and they go, they come and they go. And when you throw in my three long-term factors, which are now biting, I think we're living in a world of persistent, uh, recurrent shortages that come and go. You beat this one down, you overproduce, the commodity markets are very sensitive, you'll have periods where you crash the price of, of, of cobalt or nickel or whatever, but in the end, uh, the pressure is on, there's insufficient copper, insufficient lithium, and so on and so forth. And how to invest a portfolio is to look ahead and see, uh, this is what we try and do in the Grantham Foundation, uh, where we have 75% VC, of which uh, two thirds is green. We're saying, where are the real bottlenecks? We have two investments in, in extracting lithium more plentifully or cheaper. But then the real play is replace lithium uh, with sodium or lithium air, where you have maybe three times the density, or in the case of sodium uh, ion, you have a thousand times more sodium than you have lithium. These are the kind of things one has to invest in. Uh, think of ways of improving agricultural output. We have an investment in, in uh, very early stage research that might improve uh, 10 or 15% the productivity of wheat and rice. Uh, these are the kind of things one wants to be doing. And the equivalent exists in tradable stocks, but it's not an area which I'm spending my time in. I have to say, by the way, that the, it's thoroughly exciting the amount of creativity uh, and, and enthusiasm that goes on in the green VC world. This is the one part of capitalism where these guys literally are a little altruistic. I mean, I hope they don't get drummed out of the capitalism club uh, for being that way, but they really actually do care uh, about doing something useful about, about helping the world. And they do see some of the risks that I have been talking about. And, I think American capitalism is in a very sad state. It's suffering from monopoly features, fat and happy. It's captured too many regulatory organizations, institutions, including the US government, basically. Uh, so the US economy is run for the benefit of large corporations by and large. And, and this is reflected in the highest profit margins in this 20 year window that we have ever seen. It, it's also reflected in a, a new form of capitalism, which is you want to, if you want to make money, it's pretty simple. You create a mile shortage of your product. And you do this by getting on the telephone and lobbying your, your, your uh, competitors and, and you end up in jail. So a much better way <laughs> is, is to do it by having the culture do it for you. And the modern culture is you blame the stockholders. The stockholders don't want CapEx. So nobody does CapEx. And CapEx has dwindled down to a world record low fraction of GDP over the last 20 years when this new culture has taken hold. So you under CapEx the whole time and you use that cash flow to buy your stock back. And oh, it is terrific for profits. It is lousy for jobs and wages. It is slightly a handicap to growth. So GDP growth has definitely gotten a bit slower. Productivity is actually slowing down a bit, as you might expect. But profit margins are heavenly and far fatter than normal. And the Justice Department has done a Rip Van Winkle and has gone sound asleep for the duration and hasn't opposed any of the consolidation and the monopoly features that have been ticking nicely through the system. So that's why the profit margins are large. Schumpeter, by the way, back in the 1950s, he worried the big problem with capitalism was that it was too successful and that he imagined the day when it would become so powerful that it would basically run the government. And what worried him then was that it would be a pushback from society and, and it would become what he worried about, it was it would become socialist. 
but there are other other bad things that can happen when you push back. But the the fact is that the average worker in the U.S. has not received any increments since 1975. Maybe up to 10 percent, maybe nothing uh, adjusted for inflation. And the dopey French, whose bottoms we have been kicking for this 50-year period, uh, are up 150 percent. And um, which is pretty remarkable. I know we've been kicking their bottoms because I've read Business Week off and on for 50 years, and it's full of articles over the years about eurosclerosis and how the French love their time off and they'll strike if you threaten to have them uh, retire over the age of 50. Um, <laughs> and nevertheless, when they go to work, they're productive uh, and their average, somehow they've had a system where the average worker is up 150, the dopey Brits are up 60, and the Americans are up zero. And yet the GDP has been a little bit less in the US uh, over the 50 years, uh, a little bit more over the last 15, and, and not that far behind anyway in the 50 years. So what has happened? Well, it, it is undeniably the case that all of that extra money has flowed upwards to the rich and the average worker has had no benefit. And 50 years is a long time uh, to have no increment in an hourly work, in an hour's work. And in the end, it's counterproductive. I like to quote Henry Ford, you know, if I don't pay my workers a, an honest wage, uh, how are they going to buy my cars? And that's a pretty good idea. And um, we seem to have forgotten it. So what have I left out? Um, many things, no doubt, but uh, over to you, David. Well, thanks very much, uh, Jeremy. I, in terms of, um, I'm not going to say missing out, but, but something that I think that uh, we'd want to know is, and, and maybe, and, and maybe you can, you would just say that, uh, you're looking for secular uh, growth stories and uh, shortages that will transcend the business cycle. Uh, are you worried at all about a recession? Do you think we'll have a recession this year? Uh, are you worried about it? Uh, it may not even have an influence on how you're investing, considering that your time horizon is very long, but let's say for, uh, you know, the, the people that you've spoken to and dealt with over your entire career, people that have to say mark to market, uh, or respond to their unit holders on a monthly or quarterly basis. Uh, what do you say to the, 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 so do you have a recession forecast the way you see the economy? And if you do, what would you advise, uh, portfolio managers in the public market space to position for that. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Grantham Foundation, our performance is absolutely vital to us because it governs how much we can pay out as grants as well as everything else. And uh, with 75% in VC, you better believe our 25% is credit default swaps and short Russell, <laughs> short NASDAQ, <laughs> Uh, and so on. Um, but what if you have a more normal portfolio? The one component for the long term that is very interesting that I missed, um, which GMO has a, a very good fund, and that's a resource fund. We have a very good five-year record in that one too. And both of them and the climate are slightly ahead of the S&P, which has been the guy to beat over five years. And uh, our, our resource fund just attempts to look out at the problems, anticipate them, and, and get ahead. But resources have some very interesting features. First of all, they at 10-year horizons, I know that's a long horizon, but they are negatively correlated with the balance of your portfolio. When resources are going up, the rest there's pressure on your, the rest of your portfolio and vice versa. Now, no other group diversifies like resources, not even close. Even, you know, you pick utilities that... The correlation never gets kind of below 75%. Uh, but this one, 
after five years, it's down to 25. And at 10 years, it's actually very tiny negative correlation. Brilliant. And when inflation occurs, not always, but almost always, it benefits for obvious reasons. So it is not only a good diversifier, but it's a particularly good one now when you're suddenly, after 20 years, worried about inf inflation again. So let me get that plug in. Um, what else to own? Um, things that are above suspicion for a while here would be a pretty good idea. But the main thing is avoid the US because of this rather strange, almost inexplicable um, bias. The US is so, so much more expensive this time around. Um, in 2000, everybody was expensive. This time around, it's the US is expensive and the rest of the world is not particularly expensive. So you have a great opportunity, really, to go into the emerging market and the developed world and, and buy some equities and not feel too guilty. And GMO in its asset allocation is doing precisely that. Uh, but don't own short-term US equities. If you want to have US equities because you have to, then for heaven's sake, play the long game and do resources and, and climate change. And, and pretty well stay away from everything else. Deep value, by the way, is not that bad either. So if you wanted to add a third one, um, medium value is, is not interesting at all. It, it, it did too well too quickly. Uh, deep value, uh, of course, deep value is in the way of a major meltdown also. So you have, you have a risk return there. They are out of, out of line cheap way in the 10% trade off against the rest of the market. But you could argue that they have pretty high risk too. So you want to be a bit careful. But they're the three areas if you had to own US equities. But so I would, would I also assume that you're, uh, you're fundamentally bearish on the US dollar? Yes, okay. I am long term. I only do currency bets quite long term. Everyone else does it short term. If you if you play the really cheap ones like the yen over the long term, the long term value is not bad in the currency market. It does tend to work. And uh, the yen at 150 is pretty weird. It traded for years at 110 to the dollar. And then it goes to 150 because it had 2% inflation versus our eight. <laughs> well, what do you make of that? You know, it should have been 6% cheaper and it became 30% more expensive. Um, so we are long the yen as part of our package uh, of long some gold, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a strange creature at the best of time, uh, to add to our short positions. But um, the long the long gold would would be correlated. I mean that be that that dovetails with your long resources. So I was going to ask if the gold yeah. was part and parcel of that. It yes it is, and I'm more comfortable with resources because they're real and you use them. Um, I've never been that comfortable with gold, but we own more now. Uh, typically, we own none, but we own a, a modest position. What what gold. what what sparked your what what sparked that the move in the move into gold from zero to something? What did you see? Um, I, I I saw a long, dreary economic reckoning, and and a bear market. I don't think the bear market is likely to end until deep into next year. And uh, I think the fundamentals, hmm. because of that long list of the long term is now, I, I, I think uh, could drag out uh, for quite a while. Um, and uh, particularly with the interruption of the presidential cycle. But uh, after April, uh, we, we will probably, coincidentally or otherwise, we will begin to see uh, pressure on, on profit margins and GDP growth and the labor market. And everyone will be surprised uh, because they always are um, that they were head faked by short term good news because the economy moves so much more slowly uh, than people understand. And, and it's one of those many things that somehow people never adjust for. Let me just give you, if I may, uh, uh, two minutes on one of the great puzzlements 
of my life, and that is 25 years ago, Ben Inker and I uh, did something called explaining PE. And we asked the question, not how do you predict it, but what actually explains the short-term movements in PE? Just PE, not the market. And what we found was it was pretty easy. The, the portfolio managers hate inflation and, and inflation volatility uh, over 2%, and they love profit margins. And way, way down in, in third place is stability of growth. Growth itself has no correlation uh, with PE because talk to a portfolio manager. If you're bouncing around rapid growth, you're dealing with risk. What they would love is plus three, plus three, plus three, plus three. That's what is good for PE. If you're going plus nine, minus two, you might average three and a half, but they do not prefer it, trust me. So you want stability of GDP in distant third place. But if you take that model since 1925, you have a correlation coefficient of 0.9. In other words, everything you know about the market is wrong. It is not, the market collectively is not forecasting the future. The market is a coincident indicator of comfort. What does a portfolio manager feel comfortable with? What does he feel uncomfortable with? And that does it. And inflation, they loathe, and it immediately goes down every time since 1925 until, drum roll, uh, the middle of 2021. The middle of 2021, inflation picks up unexpectedly. Why it would be unexpected with all that money around and so on and so forth, and, 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 and lockdowns and so on, who knows? But in any case, it picks up and starts to rise pretty dramatically and, and theoretically unexpected and therefore shocking people, and the market goes up. The market does not go up for, blue, for speculative stocks, which are crashing, but it does go up for the S&P. Why? This is unique. So what happens in our model? The model has never made a mistake until 2000. In 2000, I wish I could show you an exhibit actually, but in 2000, it calls for the highest PE in history, which it gets, but it goes 40% higher and then the model explains. 18 months later, it's back down to the model. But that, that's one 18-month super error, although we got directionally, we were perfect. And then it tracks beautifully again until July of 2021. Inflation goes up, the market goes up, our explanatory PE drops like a stone, the market goes up. Then, of course, January the 1st, they say, whoops, maybe inflation does matter after all. For six months, they completely buy into the transitory argument, and they have touching faith in the Fed. My argument, of course, I hope is well known by now that the Fed has never gotten anything right since Paul Volcker. Uh, they have merely created an environment conducive to a chain-linked series of super bubbles that break with outrageously consequential effects, painful effects. And they don't seem to mind that. And they brag about the fact that they have been pushing up the price of, of assets and helping the economy, which it does, without considering the fact that they always break and hurt the economy when you least need it. And they keep very quiet during that phase. And, uh, and here we are again. We don't learn from experience at all. But in any case, people have touching faith in the Fed. That's their business. And therefore, they, they believed transitory for six months. And then they said, whoops, and the market came down pretty fast. But our model says much worse than one six months of inflation is a rolling inflation. And so the model is deteriorating. So it's now down to 17 PE um, and falling. And um, And the market is way behind. It is not 17 PE, it is 27. So my, my attitude is with a bit of luck, we may settle for something like 3000 on the S&P all being well, and assuming that my extra factors don't bite too hard. If the extra factors bite pretty hard, which sadly they might, uh, then the market will go closer to 2000 than 3000. Let me point out last time it went to 666, the devil's number. 
And so even at 2000, it's made huge progress since 2009, has it not? Uh, or if it went settled for split the difference at 20, 2,500. But I think you better count on, on 3,000. So I, I, I think the market is very likely uh, to be quite a bit lower. Uh, the economy is very likely to be quite a bit weaker. Profit margins very likely to be lower, et cetera, et cetera, and very likely to take longer than you would like. Okay, that's just history. All I do is look at the history and say, the best guess is that a bubble will behave like a bubble. And the more remarkable meta level question is how come people can get away with saying nobody saw it coming each time nobody saw it coming when the data is screaming that you can't possibly miss it you first semester course of statistics you could not miss 1929 you could not miss 1972 you absolutely categorically could not miss 2000 when it went to 35 times earnings the previous high pe had been 21 it went to 35, for heaven's sake. In Japan, it went to 65. No, you cannot miss these bubbles. And you could not miss the one in 2021. It went, it went to a, a peak that rivaled 2000. And in some ways, it was cheaper. Some ways, it was more expensive. But it was a very, very obvious bubble. Do not tell me uh, that you can't see these things. And they all break, no exceptions. And uh, if you say that, you'll be called a perma bear. But history is quite clear. There are clear bubbles. They have always broken. This one is breaking. What is the average consequence? If you're lucky, 3,000. Well, to add to your, the historical aspect of it, each one of the periods you mentioned, uh, there was also a ton of leverage behind. Uh, there was credit backing those uh, asset bubbles absolutely and uh yeah. financial failures followed so yeah. are you surprised well i guess jay powell must be surprised because he didn't mention anything about one of the banks <laughs> that actually is under his umbrella he had two days to mention something about it last week but are you what's happening right now uh, and of course uh they don't want to call it a bailout Nobody talks about who's going to pay for, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, like what's happening today with uh, uh, First Republic, which, again, is being orchestrated by the Fed, uh, much like what we saw with Bear Stearns being swallowed up uh, by uh, by Jamie Dimon back in the, the spring of 2008. Well, are you surprised by what you're seeing right now and uh, in terms of this financial quagmire? Do you think, Mariah, the stock market is telling you today it's a sunny day, so it's, it's all over, uh, no systemic risk, no con no financial contagion. Of course, everybody always fights the last war and compares it to 08, 09, but lightning never strikes twice. But what's your sense about uh, this banking, uh, let's not call it crisis, let's call it quagmire that we're in right now? Yeah, I mean, no, I'm not surprised because at 60,000 feet, you have to say the lightning always strikes. So it's not only struck twice, it struck five times. <laughs> it, it never strikes precisely the same place. It never hits the same tree. Mm -hmm. right? But it, um, it always happens uh, in every bubble because you start with such euphoria and, and such perfection fundamentally that deterioration is a heartbreaker. If you really believed the good times would roll forever, then you're not only dealing with bad information, you're dealing with a heartbreak. You know, you're disappointed. You have been let down by the system. And once again, the, the stresses are very high and something will break. I never, yes, I'm surprised it was Silicon Valley Bank, but I am not surprised that there was something surprising like Silicon Valley Bank. I would have been surprised if, if nothing had cracked. Um, and maybe next month, maybe early next year. But when you keep up a pressure, we have more debt now than we have ever had. We probably have more debt than we realize. It is well argued by some people. And uh, consequently, when you put the interest rates up, you have 
well, in the banking system, $600 billion of unrealized losses, but in the system writ large, you, you have a lot of pain already, quite a few trillion dollars, and, uh, and quite a few trillion more likely to come, and everything has consequences. When you write down perceived value by many trillions of dollars, and it will be more than 10, by the end, for sure, uh, collectively, and you've got multiple asset classes contributing, they all have consequences. And you should not be surprised if a chunk of the credit system comes under stress. Um, and maybe you shouldn't be surprised if we get lucky this time and muddle through. But these are the kind of things that have happened in each of the prior cycles. And uh, as a general principle, the bigger and broader the bubble, the longer and more painful the downside. Japan, uh, the biggest of all, is not back to the high of 1989 in the stock market. It's not back to the high in land or real estate. That's getting to be quite a long time. That's 30, 34 years and counting, uh, and, and it still hasn't reached the old high in nominal terms. So, you know, the biggest lag getting back to a high ever and the biggest pain, but it was the biggest bubble. It, it's perfectly symmetrical. And this one is pretty damn big. And it's bigger than 2000 because it includes real estate and bonds. And that one did not. So go and have a look at what happened in 2000 and the pain. And why, why was there so much pain, I ask you? You know, all of the things that they're hoping would happen this time happened that time. It was pretty painless. The economy had a gentle recession. Mm. It had no problem with real estate. It had no problem with markdown of debt. And yet the NASDAQ went down 82%, not an insignificant decline. Amazon actually went down 92 and, uh, and the S&P went down 50. So be advised, this is not a genteel uh, setback like 2000. And these were multi-year. I mean, these were basically uh, three that to four three years. years. Three everybody, years. Everybody's asking. Everybody, everybody is convinced that uh, the, the, we had the lows in October, and uh, yeah. I, you know. I, and what I've been saying is, we we haven't even seen uh, the full imp the economy resets to these interest rates uh, over time. We haven't even. I don't think we've come close to seeing the full brunt. If people say to me. Where's the recession, Rosenberg? I don't see the recession. It's like an odorless gas. You know, it, it catches up to you when you least expect it, just like it did in these other cycles. Um, yeah. The complacency is incredible. And now, of course, uh, double so that um, that the writing, the cavalry men in to save the uh, uh, the banking system. Um, i just not really convinced that, uh, that this story is has run its course. I think this, this credit contraction is actually just starting. Well, that's certainly a decent possibility based on history. But let, the, let me just repeat that NASDAQ. Yeah. NASDAQ went down 40% in 2000. Whoopee, it's all over. That was quick. That wasn't too bad. I, I survived it barely, but I survived it. The point is 2001. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 2001 was down 20%. Yeah. 2002. And it, and it was, even before 9/11 it was still in a, it was still in a in a in the fangs of a bear absolutely and 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 2002 was down 30 so you had minus 40 minus 20 minus 30 um that's how you get to minus 82 <laughs> it was pretty painful but everyone thought it was over after the first 40 percent decline well so it's like the same thing in the last cycle when I was at Merrill everybody thought it was over with bear Stearns before Bear Stearns, they all thought it was over, you know, with it was over with uh, uh, New Century Financial. It was over with uh, Countrywide. It's over with Bear Stearns. And yeah. uh, and in the final analysis, like you said, at the 666, the problem child, which were the banks, were priced for zero. I have to I have to brag here a little bit that on the day the market hit hit the low in 2009, I posted one of only two papers I've ever written outside of a quarterly cycle. Now I've, I've quit that. I, I do uh, special papers, but in those days, uh, only quarterly letters. 
And I posted one called Reinvesting When Terrified. And it was only one page for once. <laughs> and it said, you are not going to call the bottom. Well, but get together a battle plan. This is the cheapest prices for 20 years. We have double digit imputed returns on GMO's forecast for the next seven years. Go to your committee, get the battle plan together and start getting your money back in the market. Of course, you're terrified. Of course, you're practically in terminal paralysis, we used to call it in the 70s. But that's what you have to deal with. Uh, so I, I have not always been bearish. <laughs> and uh, there will come a time probably when we reach another level. But uh, that was a very, very handsome opportunity to buy stocks. Well, it sounds like right now, you know, uh, my opinion, uh, I think that uh, Brian Moynihan is 100% right uh, that this recession starts. I have second or third quarter. He has third or fourth quarter. We're splitting hairs. Uh, and what's happening now with the banks uh is not good in any respect getting saved or not saved uh this is going to complicate the outlook for the economy uh that much further but the good news for your unit holders is that uh, you have them in strategies that either are inversely correlated to what i see happening uh or not correlated at all so uh I think that's uh, that's probably the good news. Um, certainly, a lot better than being in cash. Uh, I, I, so I should um, I should add that the Grantham Foundation, in the year ending June, which is the kind of academic year for uh, for endowments and foundations, we were on Cambridge database. We we got the infamous zero, which means we were it. We were the number one. We had the best performance in the 12 month period. And all you have to do to get that is don't mark to market. Uh, nothing to do with us. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that our, our VC portfolios had not marked. Um, and it's, it's good to be number one, though, even, even if it takes a little bit of, of legitimate cheating to get there. <laughs> well, uh, well, congratulations. Uh, Jeremy, uh, we're past uh, the hour. I, I think we, we, we could go on uh, for a long time. It was uh, thoroughly enjoyable and uh, educational. Uh, so thanks for your time uh, and your wisdom. Uh, and uh, I'd love to get you on again. I know it's a, uh, boy, I think we booked this uh, ages ago just so I could get into your calendar. So thanks again. Uh, no, no, you, tremendous, it, tremendous. I, 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 I'm not sure about uh, everybody that's watching. Uh, I, I was always I jotted down about four pages of notes, so uh, that was really wonderful. It, it's been a great pleasure, really, and no trouble. But I should end one sentence. Uh, let me repeat the fact that the American VC industry is far and ahead of the rest of the world. It's the most important subset of capitalism, and it seems to be in wonderfully good shape. And yes, it's going to take a couple of years, perhaps of bashing around the head that will set up a wonderful entry point. I do recommend it to everybody. And you well, could say that's talking my book, of course. That's it okay. Well, well, it's, uh, but um, you have the pedigree and the performance. So uh, I think that's totally appropriate. Uh, well, everybody that, uh, that concludes today's call, but before we adjourn, uh, just a reminder that uh, I have uh, one of the country's best oil analysts, uh, coming on the call, one of the best royal analysts uh, I've seen in my 40 years in the business. His name is Marshall Atkins. For those that don't know him, uh, maybe you want to Google him. Uh, he is the senior manager director and he's at the head of uh, energy investment banking at Raymond James. He's been calling the energy markets uh, for, well, about as long as I've been in the business, about four decades Look, uh, I heard Marshall speak uh, in late January. Uh, I sat beside him at this uh, bespoke uh, symposium in Vail. Uh, we both presented. Um, his presentation actually turned me from an oil bear, uh, and Jeremy, you'll like this, uh, to an oil bull. Uh, he is definitely worth listening to, and especially his compelling list of proprietary statistics. And uh, he had a chart package 
with slides that blew me away. They were definitely unique. Uh, I don't think that, um, you know, considering how important the oil price is uh, as a price for the economy and the capital markets, uh, I don't think this is a call you want to miss. This guy is the real deal. Uh, the call is set for March 22nd, next Wednesday. And Jeremy, you're invited on the, to, uh, to 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 watch as well. Obviously, it's I'm at the going, usual I'm four p.m. It's at the usual four p.m. time slot. So, Jeremy, thanks for doing this today. I know we started earlier. Uh, so, till March 22nd, everybody, four p.m. All the best. Take care.